Uh, good afternoon. My name is Kate Kuchin, and I am a software engineer at Heptio. And today I'll be talking about making UIs to make Kubernetes more accessible and easier to use. If you'd like to find me on the internet, I have a pretty disjointed online presence, but you can find me on Twitter at excoochme, on GitHub at Kate K, which I did not know about Kate's when I made that, and at, on Instagram at Kate Kuchin, which I only mention because that is where the pictures of my dog are. <laughs> in previous lives, I worked on Google's now defunct social network Orkut, May She Rest in Peace, writing documentation, conduct conducting user research, and coordinating localization. I've also worked on several political campaigns, including one that resulted in the world's largest earth pressure tunnel boring machine, Bertha, getting stuck under Seattle for over a year. So you're welcome, Seattle. Um, for some reason, I have a master's in public administration, so if you want someone to rant to about having a degree you don't need or use or want, I'm your girl. Um, and also, I have written software that powers electric car chargers and internet-connected sous vide cookers, the latter of which probably did not need a Wi-Fi wi wi chip in the first place. Um, and after leaving the wild and wonderful world of connected devices, I joined NodeSource and worked with a team of great engineers there on Node.js. Which brings us up to date. I've been at Heptio for just under a year, which makes me sort of old in Heptio years. Um, Heptio, for those of you who don't know, was founded by Joe Beta and Craig McClucky, two of the founders of Heptio in 2016. And our mission is to grow the Kubernetes community by 10x by making the technology more accessible and usable. I work with a great group of humans at Heptio. We're called the Snow Squad for no real reason, but it sounds cool. Um, and our team works to build products that make Kubernetes easier to adopt and easier to use. Our upcoming project is super, super exciting, um, but unfortunately it is not launched yet and I am not here to launch it. <laughs> so I will not be talking about it in too much detail for what I presume are obvious reasons, um, paramount of which is that I don't really wanna get fired. So what will I be talking about? Building applications to increase Kubernetes adoption and make life easier once you've adopted it. It doesn't really roll off the tongue. Um, so in short, what I'll be talking about is the role UIs can play in making Kubernetes easier to adopt and easier to use. These really are two distinct problems, but if we build the right products, we can hopefully tackle them both together. All right, so we already went over who I am and what I do, and as much as I'd love to talk to y'all about Orkut for 30 minutes, um, you'll have to find me after and I can dazzle you with some Brazilian Portuguese. Um, but next up, I'm gonna talk about how UI engineers, designers, product people, and just general non-systems engineers can get ramped up on Kubernetes. And also how systems engineers and other Kubernetes experts can help with this onboarding. There are a lot of problems left to solve with Kubernetes, and many of them could be addressed with the UI. But if people who are experts in UI and design can't understand the problem space, we can't really build solutions that are much of use to anyone. So after I've waxed poetic about onboarding, ramping up, being kind to one another in the process, we'll move on to more generally speaking about what kind of value UIs can add. There are the traditional benefits of UIs and there are also some unique benefits that UIs can offer in making Kubernetes more accessible. All right, so before we get started talking about those kind of problems that we can solve, the first we need to understand the problem space, but there's one catch. Kubernetes was designed by systems engineers for systems engineers, which is great if you're a systems engineer. For the rest of us, Kubernetes is really, really intimidating. With the exception of those people who created Kubernetes who were there at the very beginning, everyone in this room was probably a new Kubernetes user at some point, or is a new Kubernetes user now, or will be a new Kubernetes user next week. So you all probably know that it can be pretty daunting. So my first real introduction to Kubernetes came my first week at Heptio. I spent the week in the Seattle office learning as much as I could and trying to not fully panic at what I'd gotten myself into. I had the luxury of having Joe Beta, one of the creators of Kubernetes, get in front of the whiteboard and spend two hours or more with me and a couple, other, a couple other new hires and just go over the basic concepts of Kubernetes. It was incredible, but it's not exactly scalable. Um, and also, listening to someone who created a technology is incredibly inspiring, interesting, and if done well, can make you feel like you can be an expert in a space and you want to be but it's also not immediately useful. On day one, I knew that the Kubernetes scheduler could be optimized for resource allocation or latency, but I didn't know how to set up a cluster. I probably didn't even know what the Kubernetes scheduler was, and I definitely didn't know how to use kubectl. So you kind of can come into this space feeling a little bit adrift, and there are a lot of resources out there, and that's great, but it can be a little bit intimidating to find out where to start. Especially if you're not a systems engineer, this deluge of resources can just increase the intimidation. So here's where I'd recommend you start. 
I know this seems like obvious advice, but it bears repeating. Read the docs. The folks who work on Kubernetes docs have done a lot of really, really awesome work, especially in this past year. One thing that I'm particularly excited about um, are the user journeys. I wish they would have existed when I was first starting out last year. So the user journeys documentation on the core Kate docs consists of three tracks, each building on one another. If you're brand new to Kubernetes, I'd recommend starting out at the foundational app developer journey. The Kubernetes documentation quite helpfully is differentiates between app developers and cluster operators. And the documentation targeted towards app developers isn't a comprehensive overview of Kubernetes itself, but instead focuses on using Kubernetes rather than the underlying infrastructure. For non-systems engineer, I recommend starting there because it's more approachable. And when you move into the more complex information, you'll have some context. So the foundational user journey does a great job of breaking down what you need to know and breaking it into small enough pieces that it's not overwhelming. It walks you through setting up a cluster, either through a web-based environment or Minikube, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and then deploying your first application to that cluster. It also provides some really digestible information about the basic Kubernetes architecture. One of the best introductory texts I've also seen, it's been around for a couple years, is written by Matt Butcher of Deus uh, a couple years ago. It's super accessible and it's called The Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes. Um, it's an article in the form of a children's book. It's about a 10 minute read, but if you don't like reading, there's also a YouTube version. version. For those of you who don't hate reading and like it enough to read a whole book, uh, <laughs> Kubernetes Up and Running by Kelsey Hightower, Brendan Burns, and Joe Beta is a really comprehensive and mostly accessible resource. Personally, I would start with other resources first, but when you're ready for a deeper dive, this is the book I'd recommend. Um, we do have a few of them over at the Heptio booth, so stop by and grab one. We'd be more than happy to give you a, the first few chapters. And this is a slight tangent. Um, this isn't actually documentation, but Joe also does uh, TGIK every Friday, which is sort of like a reading rainbow for Kubernetes. Um, <laughs> It's pretty awesome, and he's done over 30 of them. They're not exactly sequential, but the first five or so are really, really good introductory overviews of a lot of Kubernetes concepts. So another great, albeit more expensive, route is to do a formal training course. Generally speaking, if your company pays for conferences like this or continuing education, they'll pay for a training, and you'll get a lot of value out of it. Um, so the price tag might be shocking to an individual, but it's less shocking to a company. Um, the Linux Foundation itself offers a Kubernetes fundamental training course that's online and self-paced, and you can also take the certified Kubernetes administrator exam afterwards. You buy them both for 500 bucks, you save $100. A few of my colleagues have done both of them, and they say the, course is the exam is pretty tough, so if it's available, I would take the course first. Self-paced, but they say it takes about 15 to 20 hours. Another option is Heptio's hands-on workshop. Um, you have the benefit of a live instructor, and, happy and, and it's super, super helpful when you're starting out with Kubernetes. Uh, I just sat in one this past Tuesday, and there's one coming up again next week online, and then one again in June. So if you're feeling inspired after this conference, you should sign up. The course is two days long, one four-hour session each day, and normally it's 900 bucks, but the education team has generally offered a coupon code, which brings the cost down to $400, and it's good for the next 60 days. This is the code, it's on the slides. Um, if you are all, at all interested, this is a great deal. Uh, I would take it. So once you've kind of gotten your head straight and you're ready to get dirty, you really do need to set up a cluster. Um, I think it's the easiest way to get a sense of what's actually going on. There are a lot of options for this, uh, and I'll just talk about a few of them. But for your first cluster, I would recommend Minikube. Minikube is a super cool tool, and it runs Kubernetes locally. It runs a single node Kubernetes cluster inside a VM on your machine and it's ideal for getting started. A lot of developers use it long-term for development environments as well. There also are some web-based environments, which are great for just kicking the tires. I don't recommend using them long-term. Once you're ready to do more than kick the tires, I would switch to Minikube. Um, having a persistent cluster local to your machine is just a better approximation of what it's like to work with Kubernetes in production than a browser-based tool, but they are really great for just generally getting a feel of pr principles. Or if you really just want to go ham, you can just go straight to one of the cloud providers. Um, if you're going to do this, honestly, the simplest way, in my opinion, is a GKE cluster. You quite literally just click Create Cluster in the cloud console, and then there's a lot of documentation about getting your cluster set up, getting your application deployed, and exposing the application to the internet via service. Second to that, I would recommend Heptio's AWS Quick Start Cluster. It's also super simple to set up. And if you're familiar with AWS more than G Cloud, or you already have an AWS account, you might find it easier than a GKE cluster. 
Whichever you choose, just remember that cloud providers are not free, but the other two options are. So my final piece of advice uh, for both people who are new to Kubernetes and also the more seasoned experts in the house, uh, one of the most valuable learning tools someone who is new to Kubernetes and new to distributed systems in general has are your war stories. People newer to the industry have not necessarily experienced these large production grade deployment debacles. And if we don't know those pains, it's really hard to appreciate how Kubernetes eases them. So, if, you find, if you're a systems engineer or just generally a human who knows a bit about Kubernetes and you find yourself in a position to help out or mentor someone new to Kubernetes, these are a few things I'd keep in mind. First, don't assume core knowledge of core CS principles. More people are entering the field from diverse backgrounds, myself included, and they don't teach me much about hardware and networking in the poli sci department. Meeting people where they're at is super important if we're gonna to continue to grow the size of the community. Expanding on that a little bit, one thing that may not be clear to people who just got started are the differences between patterns and system, between standard patterns and distributed systems and what is unique to Kubernetes. Some of the core principles in Kubernetes might be old hat to people who have been in distributed systems forever, but to those of us just entering the space, they're brand new. So being able to distinguish between the two is super, super helpful. Finally, and this is something we're all guilty of from time to time, myself included, when you're really familiar with a technology, it's tempting to talk about the quirks and obtuse use cases of it. When you're new to a technology, it is not helpful. Uh, <laughs> you don't need to gloss over the more complex things, but you should really try to be cognizant of when you find yourself going down rabbit holes and get back to talking about things that they need to know rather than just going off on tangents about things that are quirky about your preferred technology. So this quote was referencing the Node.js community, but I think the same holds true for any growing community. Explosive growth means a huge portion of the community is new. So education, onboarding, and culture, welcoming of newcomers is essential to doing the work. Kubernetes is growing explosively. There's no doubt about that. There are over 4,000 of us in Denmark right now talking about it. And because of that, we have to prioritize welcoming, onboarding, and welcoming and onboarding new members of the community. So if we're gonna grow this community 10X, we just have to diligently support new Kubernetes users and operators. All right, so I could go on forever about all of the resources I found helpful when I was starting out, and if you are in that same position right now, please come tap me on the shoulder later. I'm more than happy to go more in depth. But now that we've gone over how a product team can get equipped with, a new, with enough Kubernetes knowledge to understand a problem space, let's talk about what kind of problems can be solved with the UI, and also talk about the ones that can't. I'll also talk specifically about the CNCF conformance tests and SANA buoy scanner as a concrete example of how we use UIs to make Kubernetes easier to adopt and easier to use. So I'm not here to argue that UIs should take over the world and entire, entirely replace CLIs and other tools. And even if I did believe that, I wouldn't float that thesis at a conference for systems engineers. <laughs> but that doesn't mean there aren't some things that UIs do well that CLIs don't. So let's talk about what those things are and how we can apply them to Kubernetes. We just talked a lot about all of the reasons Kubernetes can be unapproachable, and we have the potential to build apps that ameliorate a lot of that. For instance, a UI could guide you through spinning up a cluster, creating your first pods, creating a deployment. So you can focus on understanding what these resources are rather than trying to figure out why, what kubeconfig file are I using, or where the YAML indentation is off, or oh wait, I needed to create the namespace first, these are some of the biggest pain points we see new users run into, and they don't, they shouldn't be. Like, that is not what we should be thinking about when we're starting using Kubernetes. So, when you're brand new to a system or an application, a CLI or a config file can be a pretty intimidating entry point. If you don't yet have a handle on how a system works or what it does, it's helpful to have graphical clues as to what is going on. This is especially true with systems engineering and Kubernetes. When you have an enormous, an enormously flexible API like Kubernetes, everything becomes configurable, which means there are lots and lots of knobs you could tweak, but that doesn't necessarily mean you should or you would want to. And UIs can provide a way to surface those knobs in a way that can it, it, surface the knobs that need to be exposed right off the bat, and only those knobs, and display them in such a way that they're parsable by more, na more naive operators. If we provide sensible defaults, we can obfuscate some of the complexity initially and expose these knobs further down the line when new users are more comfortable with the system. And those more advanced knobs, maybe they never make it into a UI. Maybe they only ever exist in a CLI. So speaking of providing sensible defaults, I just wanted to tell a story about when I first started Heptio. 
I asked Tim St. Clair, who's in the room, um, and what he thought we should be building, and God blessed him. He has helped me so much in the past year, and he's taught me a lot, including to not listen to him on what he thinks we should build for you eyes. <laughs> what he described was a dashboard that exposed every possible configuration option. And just to put that in perspective, the Cube API server CLI alone has 109 flags. Cube Controller Manager has 80. Kubelet has 126. Building a UI with that kind of customization isn't gonna help anyone, even the Tim St. Clairs of the world. However, building a UI that surfaces those knobs that need to be exposed off the bat, and only those knobs, uh, is actually really useful. So to that end, I think it's important to point out that just because UIs can be helpful doesn't mean that they are the solution for everything. There are a lot of things they do well, but there are a lot of things CLIs do well, and a lot of things config files do well. So if you're familiar with the system and you want to quickly go and do something, a CLI is likely the tool you're going to reach for. For instance, using AWS or G Cloud, they're good examples of that hybrid experience. Most people use both the UI and the CLI. For instance, if I want to quickly check what the most recent image tag I pushed up to my Google container registry is, I'm just going to go look at the UI and check the tag at the top of the list. But I didn't push that image to the registry using the UI. And the same principle holds true with config files. There are things they just do better with you than UIs. If you have people constantly fiddling with settings in a UI, there's no centralized place to see what, configura what configurations exist, what's changed, or when something broke. But for initial configurations, especially for new users, UIs can be really helpful. Ultimately, you probably want your config file in version control, though, because I might set up my initial Jenkins configuration in the UI to make sure everything works, but long term, I'd much, much rather rely on a Jenkins file that's checked into my repo. All right, so transitioning a little bit, there's also a lot of interesting data in a Kubernetes cluster that I don't think it's a, and I don't think it's a very controversial statement to say that web UIs do a better job of visualizing data than CLIs. But when we have all this interesting data, and most of it, but we have all of this interesting data, and most of it is pretty hidden, especially if you're a newbie. Diagrams like you find in the core Kubernetes docs are super helpful for getting a handle on different resource types, but having visibility into your cluster can help submit these concepts. So this is a super, super simple visualization I built when I was starting Heptio about a year ago. Uh, I originally forked it from a Kubernetes UI project uh, topology graph and changed the data structure bit and added on. So this is directly data from my cluster when I was first learning Kubernetes last year. So it's simple and small and easy enough to grok what's going on. And I was also already familiar with the resources that existed because I created them. And I'm not saying this is a perfect or groundbreaking visualization, but having something like this made Kate's feel more tangible to me, being able to see the relationship between services and pods, between pods and containers, between pods and nodes, helped me start putting the pieces together in a way that I could make sense of. In the same visualization, I also built just this little slider, uh, which had additional information about each resource. Being able to see this information in a format other than YAML is what, when you're starting out, is immensely helpful. When you're first starting out using Kates, you don't even really know what to look for. So surfacing the data, even if it's just a table, this is nothing fancy, makes it more clear what attributes different resources have and which ones are immediately important. And one thing in particular I like to call out here is the CLI box in the bottom right. Like we were talking about earlier, CLIs and UIs can work together. I wouldn't expect someone to visit this visualization every single day. I probably wouldn't expect them to go back to it after they understood what was going on. But I would expect them to use the kubectl CLI every day once they were an operator or using Kubernetes. And so giving them little hints on what that's going to look like I think is a really useful tool, that, a really useful way we can use UIs. So, not all data needs fancy visualizations. Most probably doesn't. But the data formats we use, whether YAML or JSON or XML or any other number of formats, are designed for computers, not for humans. So providing a simple way to make this data easier to understand and take action is one of the core benefits of a UI. Which brings us to our work on Sonobuoy Scanner. Um, for a little background, the CNCF defined a suite of conformance tests to ensure no matter how you set up your cluster, it's configured properly and supports the required Kubernetes APIs. There are many, many ways to spin up a cluster. It could be installed by one of a dozen vendors, delivered by a containers as a service offering, or simply created from the upstream binaries. Regardless of how the cluster is created, the obvious questions come to mind. Does this cluster work as it should? Like, did I mess this thing up? 
So Heptiosanabui is an open source diagnostic tool that answers that question. But after we launched it, we got two really helpful pieces of feedback from the community. People weren't sure how to run this thing, and they weren't sure how to make sense of the output. So just for reference, let's run through the first use of the Sanabui CLI. When you first start, you have to make sure you have Golang installed. You have to then configure your Go path. You have to download Sanabui with a Go get. You have to run Sanabui run, wait for the test wait for the test to finish, and then do a Sanabui retrieve, which downloads a tarball snapshot into your local dot directory. Then you extract the contents into a dot results folder with this command. Um, and only then do you get to this results directory, where when you poke around through several nested directories, you find your conformance test results, which live in a file called junit underscore zero one dot XML. And when you open that file, you'll find 2,000 lines of XML. And please don't get me wrong here, this is an enormously valuable tool and enormously valuable data. And Sanabui itself is very cool and extremely extensible. But as a human and not a computer, for my first use, I would prefer this data to be in a different format. So, we built Scanner. Scanner is a really, really simple web UI, and it makes running Sanabui easy and viewing its results more understandable and more actionable. To run Scanner, you just go to scanner.heptio.com, copy and paste the generated kubectl command in your terminal, and apply the YAML. This will install Sonabui and run the conformance test, and when it's all done, it'll clean up after itself. Once the tests have finished running, you can easily see if any of the tests have failed, and then drill down into the logs, troubleshoot, and rerun Scanner to make sure your cluster is now properly configured. Overall, it's just a much cleaner experience than, than, than the Sonabui CLI, especially for new users. We also built Scanner because we wanted something that quickly and clearly demonstrated Sanabui's value. If you go immediately to the Sanabui repo, it's not necessarily immediate clear, immediately clear what you're going to get. With Scanner, we wanted it to be dead simple to run and super obvious what you would get with, when you ran these tests. So we may not rely on UIs for our day-to-day -day use or operations of Kubernetes, but they are an excellent way to immediately show the value of a product. If you build an intuitive and useful UI, it can function as an entry point for a product that's comprised of more than just a web app. Scanner's a great example of that. People who have never tested their cluster for conformance before and maybe didn't know what the CNCF conformance test suite was can quickly learn about it and then run them and, do, and have actual insights to fix their cluster if they need to with very little overhead. So to wrap up, I just have an anecdote from earlier this week. Um, on Tuesday, I sat in on the Heptio hands-on workshop that we had here. It's the same one we offer online. Um, and helped Heptio's VP of Finance, Shanice, throughout the course. Shanice has never written a line of code in her life. Um, but throughout the process of dockerizing an app, uh, spinning up a cluster on GKE, deploying a couple of containers to the cluster, and exposing a service, the issue she ran into didn't have anything to do with a lack of understanding. She really did a great job. Almost every single issue she ran into had to do with the YAML being indented incorrectly, or a resource having the wrong capitalization, or her Docker file being ever so slightly off. These shouldn't be problems beginners have to deal with, but they are. These are things we constantly see new users running into in the field. This is a wall they almost always, always hit. Imagine if instead of having to spend time explaining that YAML is a superset of, J of J JSON and here's a list inside of a map and oh yeah, don't worry about the hyphen, just use it, you have, you, you have all of that for free. This frees up not an insignificant amount of time to actually understand what's going on with Kubernetes rather than fighting with the config files. And to be clear here, I'm not advocating for a complete obfuscation of complexity. It's important to understand what's going on beneath the hood of a tool we use. But it's much easier to grok if we can peel an onion layer by layer, which is something we can lean on UIs to do, rather than just hand the thing to someone and say, go. So at the end of the day, Kubernetes itself should be pretty boring, and it's just not yet. Um, we, can add, we can and should be building products that make that a reality, so we can focus on more interesting problems. So with that, Thank you for coming. Um, I think we're about out of time, but I could take a couple of questions if you have them. Questions? If not, you can find me at the Heptio booth. I'll be there all afternoon. Okay. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Um, what was that visualization tool that you showed with the graph? That was something that I just built to teach myself Kubernetes. It's not, it's just on my, 
like GitHub. Um, it's not like open source. I mean, you can, it's public. Okay, but. all right, thank you. Yeah, of course. Uh, my dog's name is Helen, which was in the second slide, if you were paying attention, Joe. <laughs> what's, what's her full name? Oh, her name is Academy Award winner Helen Hunt, is her full name. <laughs> all right, thank you all for coming. Oh, where's, oh, hi. <laughs> hi, I'm, I really enjoyed your talk, and I think I find myself wondering, when you started learning about Kubernetes, uh, did, you, did you go down some rabbit holes of stuff that ended up not being as important to you? Can you address a little bit, like when people are learning, what direction should you, if you're guiding them, should you uh, direct them away from because it isn't gonna be as useful? Yeah, one of the things, or one of the traps I fell into was trying to just read the documentation straight through, um, which was not very useful. Um, I was like, where can I find the most centralized information about everything Kubernetes? And the Kubernetes documentation is really, really useful as an aggregate when you're actually interacting with Kubernetes, but to just read it straight through, it's just information overload. I would say that's the number one thing to avoid, and that's why I'm really into the user journeys things that the Kubernetes uh, documentation folks have, been, have built the last year, because it guides you through a better path than just reading A to Z. Um, I'm just wondering, how long did it take you before you were comfortable in the space? Um, <laughs> I don't know if I'm comfortable yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think it took building Scanner and deploying it to Kubernetes and actually running into some of the issues myself with some guidance from actual systems engineers to feel like I really understood what was going on. Um, luckily, I did that pretty quickly after joining Heptio, so I would say it was about three months until I felt like the concepts were really cemented. And there's still more I could learn, of course. I don't feel like I'm an expert yet. Okay. Thanks, everyone.